Oh man, I am choking on this uh-huh. stuff. I, I don't know if it's phlegm, I don't know if it's the lunch or what at this point, but it's just like... <coughs> so if Paul you, has if, corona now. It's official. Yes, I have coronavirus. <laughs> Ripperonis from the black beans. <laughs> yeah. From the black beans, yes. I ate the black beans and now I no, have these are Wait, these are huangdao, these are yellow beans. The yellow these beans. Isn't, isn't it the same beans. as black beans, but just they call it yellow beans in Chinese? No, no, these are soybeans. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, huangdao really? is well, yeah, that's why. Well, I'm dying from you... beans, you know. Yeah. It's oh, you're gonna. He's gonna have gas later. <laughs> no, it's not that <laughs> oh, kind of. Dear thing. Lord. Let's hope oh, we get no, that it's on. Still like... bean, Tom. Yeah, oh, if you God. need a fart, be sure to turn around and fart straight into your phone. So it can get no worries, my phone <laughs> picks things up pretty well as it is. So it'll come across audibly, I'm sure. Ah. <clears throat> oh man, I swear this thing is just not coming out of my throat. <clears> right. <throat> Okay. Hello. Welcome. That was one hell of an introduction uh, to Noteworthy History. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the rise of fascism, and I'm joined by a few friends of mine. So first off, I have Kevin. Hi. Very That's all I'm giving you. you gotta move on. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm also joined by Alex, who was with us in our very first recording for 20 minutes. We don't talk about that one, all right? We do talk about it. I Can think we I talked about it. Can I Yes, Thank you. yes, you may. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say. His name's Hi. You didn't Hi. even say your name. I know, I just want my introduction spot. All right, okay, fine. I mean, you asked to say your name, and then you say hi, so like... I mean, you didn't say my name, so... Like, For the rest of the enough. podcast, you will now be known as Hi. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll deal with and uh, we also have a few first-timers with us. Uh, we have Luke... All the way from the big city of Boston. Hi. I'm from Wisconsin. No, you're, no, you're not. not. You don't even like cheese. I mean, I like the ice cream there. I don't like every other dairy product, but, you know. <laughs> what a waste. Yeah. Four years, and he didn't even get to enjoy the cheese. And uh, <clears throat> also, I have joined him with me from the room right next to my room. Uh, my sister Ashley. Yo, what's up? I'm here, and we're gonna have a party today. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. And it's not just any party; it's a fascist party. Dude, <laughs> Fascism. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, man. And like, honestly, uh, with today's episode, we're gonna be looking mostly at the rise of fascism with this one guy by the name of uh, Benito Mussolini. So. Oh, dear. It's uh, it's gonna be a bit of a more focused kind of look into this stuff, but also kind of some fun stuff in there too, because this guy is kind of a whack individual, all in all. He's got um, an, awesome, an awesome haircut, I hear. Uh, it honestly makes him look like he's balding, but to each their own, I guess. <laughs> that depends on your definition of awesome, I suppose. <clears throat> yeah, but like it's it's like one of those things where it's like you don't commit to the fact that you're balding and you just like go full out. You know, it's like it's just completely gone. He's got like, there's a large bald patch in the front area, and then it's like a receding bit near the back. Like it's kind of so it looks like he doubled down on bald. male pattern baldness, like yeah, just no, more honestly. of it. <laughs> yeah, very much that. Like I mean, like, I'm sure there's no there's no top; it just sideburn around the back of his head. Yeah, it's like. Uh, do you guys, uh, maybe this is too niche of a reference, but like, you know, in, um, in Star Wars, there's like this one robot character that has like this, he's fully bald, but he has a weird band on the back of his head. It's like a computer plug-in. Yeah, it's like Lobot. Lobot. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. The Empire Strikes Back. Yep, right in Cloud City. Well, I, mm-hmm. I think this is too niche. But basically, what a, what a it's nerd. like if that computer <laughs> is his hair, that's what it looks like. <laughs> Except well, I thought really he would actually look like a droid. He's just a guy, but with things. He's just a guy with really he's shitty an earmuffs. He's, but he's just he's an also shitty they earmuffs is like a hallmark of the original. Yeah, like, they didn't you know, try Princess very Leia. hard. Okay. Yeah, you remember Leia's hair bun thing? Oh yeah, Basically, they got rid of earmuffs. that after the first movie, though. Yeah, because <laughs> then they converted like... it into a Clone Wars helmet in uh, in the TV show. Wait, what? Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, you can look it up later. I can show you. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
But yeah, I mean, talking about evil empires and Star Wars and all that stuff, we got to go back to the OG of this stuff. And we're talking about not the Nazis, which like, you know, when people talk about fascism, that tends to be like the first thing that comes up, like uh, Hitler and the Nazis and all that stuff. Or nowadays, it's skinheads in America and white power and all that stuff. I mean, nowadays, uh, even when it's not about fascism, Hitler still comes up. Yeah, that's true. Comes up quite a bit. But like... When you look at it, you go back to the big daddy of fascism, and it's uh, it's in Italy with a guy by the name of Benito Mussolini. Oh, wait, um, so Mussolini's like the big daddy of Star Wars. He's, you know... He's like, he's like Palpy's pappy, if you yeah. will. Yeah. I guess Emperor Palpy's, Palpy's got dad. kind of the style. He's not quite as bold with the style in front, but... Wow. Palpy, oh, palpy reminds me of much, Orange though. Pulp. I don't know why, but I just think Pulpy when you say Palpy. Oh, gross. I mean, his face is kind of like that by, you know, the, the original trilogy. So, <laughs> yeah. And also, like, I, I saw the newest one, too, and his face is like, like, if I thought he was, like, pretty badly messed up by the Force Lightning in Episode 3, he is gone in like the last star wars movie that just came why out. how what was the justification for him being there again he somehow lived that's all i heard Cloning. yeah like no one it's like yes he got thrown into a reactor core of a huge space uh, station that blew up which once again is in space but they were somehow able to salvage him or i don't know Some there's talk of, of like cloning and they just transferred his essence to a clone but then it's like, why does he look all dilapidated if he's a clone? Yeah, he could have given him a nice body. And they could have restored him back to like when he was like, you know, the senator from Naboo, you know, he like was a back in like episode guy. one. Yeah, I mean, like he didn't look bad by any means back then. <laughs> but like instead, they're like, you know what we should do? We should take the shitty appearance he had after he got his face electrified and make it worse. I'm <laughs> sure he's going to love it. So, <laughs> Yeah. But uh, thankfully, Mussolini was not that bad of a deal starting off. He uh, never got electrocuted, so there's that. There's that going for him. Um, but uh, he did get hung from a wire. Hung from a wire? Upside like, down. Like, like he got toes? basically like, like uh, by the leg? By the legs, yeah. He was like hung on a wire. Um, well, he's tied he up do? with wire and rope. And Why? Th they executed him, and they basically were like, we're going to like hang him like we're hanging a pig carcass, you know? So they just have him like that stripped down in the middle of the streets. So. Uh, wait, wait, but, sorry, hold on. Could you, I, I missed like half of that. What were you saying? Uh, yeah, so he, kind of a spoiler, he, uh, he kind of failed with the whole fascism thing in Italy. He wow, to get way to, wait, wait, wow, way to ruin Italian. this entire podcast, man. Now we know how it ends. Why are we even here? Oh, man. <laughs> Recording over, guys. I'm leaving. Yep, at this point, it's all over. But yeah, no, he, he didn't. Su he, he kind of suffered a pretty bad ending. But, um, you know, getting trussed up like a dead pig out in the streets, stripped down. Uh, not the best way one can go, you know? As but, you like, do. Yeah, absolutely. But, like, really, to, like, go back, this guy who's, like, now synonymous with the idea of, like, expansionist war and, you know, a government taking over everything and just kind of, like, screwing anyone who speaks out against the government. Uh, this guy uh, was a raging socialist in his youth, believe it or not. A what socialist? A, a, a raging socialist. socialist. Oh, Socialist? I thought you said a soloist. A soloist. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, he's a big fan of Han Solo. If, if you can't tell. Yeah, and, and this I guy mean, he did invent Star Wars, movies. so I guess it would make sense. Yeah, yeah, you know. I, I mean, at the end of the day, like his early years, you could probably put him in line with a guy like Solo, because um, like he grew up kind of like fighting on the streets. Um, his dad was a blacksmith, and. Uh, he, uh, he definitely taught him how to hit hard, if you will. So he'd get in scraps all the time as a kid on the streets. And uh, this kid, you know, who, you know, is beating up other fellow kids is like, you know, what's the best line of profession for me as someone who likes beating up kids? I should be a teacher. A uh, cop? 
No, no, no. A teacher. <laughs> kids. He's talking a about teacher. beating up kids. You know, it's like that power dynamic at play there. So he went ahead and he got educated to be a teacher. And, you know uh, what you taught? I, I think he taught elementary school. <clears throat> Whoa, excuse me. My voice just died there. I, I think he taught elementary school. Um, uh-huh. Okay. So, like, once again, he's not really going for, like, the hard-hitting stuff. Well, except for himself being very hard-hitting. Um, and uh, I guess that education did do him some good because he realized, like, violence ain't the answer to everything. So, no way. Uh, I know, well, isn't yeah. The answer? Well, I digress. Maybe violence isn't the answer. It's not what he was going for. It's more so that, like, I don't want to have to fight someone who has an equal chance of killing me. Uh, because in Italy, which is why which he that, taught kids. Exactly. Are you saying you the know? kids were threatening him to the same level he was threatening them? Well, not quite. No, I'm sure <laughs> I mean, he would have gotten on I'm, just I'm gonna be honest. The kids. way you're wording this, it really sounds like he like started. He like started teaching kids. Realized that beating up kids was a lot easier than beating up adults. I was like, you know what? I shall continue. Maybe I shouldn't I... fight someone my size. <laughs> Maybe I should fight someone smaller. It seems a lot easier. I mean, honestly, that's really, like, a huge part of him, too. Because, like, when he realized, you know, as an adult in the Kingdom of Italy back in, like, the late 1800s, you're supposed to join active service in the Italian army for a few years. Um, and when he realized that, and also this was, like, when Italy was all, like, you know what? We should go and take islands from the Ottoman Empire. So they're, like, fighting over little plots of land in the Mediterranean. He was like, there's a good chance that I'm going to be set overseas and I might lose my life. Or at the very least, not be able to just beat up a bunch of kids and have to face, you know, grown adults with guns, just like me. So, ah, yes. uh, when that, like, realization dawned, after he got his, like, uh, teaching certificate, he uh, went ahead and did what all decent people do, and that was to run to Switzerland. So that way he doesn't have to serve in the army. Ah, uh, yes, money and a neutral nation. I know, yeah. <clears throat> and also the best part, too, is that that came alongside with a healthy dose of socialism. This whole idea that, like, you know, the state's supposed to be out there to help you, and this whole idea that everyone's comrades and all that mm-hmm. stuff. And uh, I guess he kind of bought into it, too, because after he finally returned to Italy in 1905, he, uh, yes, they were finally like, it looks like you're overdue for getting your ass whooped in the middle of a battle. So he went ahead and was sent into the army, except he, ever, he never actually fought any battles during that time. And uh, after he was sent back home, he went ahead and started publishing the socialist newspaper. And, um, I mean, let's be honest here. Like, nowadays, you think about papers, right? You aren't really thinking about it doing much. Like, um, who reads a newspaper nowadays? Aside from yeah. I'm, think- I'm thinking English majors. I don't think even English majors read them. They're too busy reading blogs, you know? (laughs) But, like, as a newspaper uh, editor, uh, back in the day, he actually had some sway over things. He he joined a few socialist circles in Italy that came out buddy-buddy. And uh, he was like, you know what? I'm going to take the socialist thing hard. So he goes ahead and he's like, Italy should not be fighting wars to expand its empire. Italy doing that is bad, it's imperialistic, it's against my tenets of socialism, because I am a peace-loving man who whoops kids. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then he also went ahead and said that, you know, screw the king, he's no legitimate ruler, who made him in charge? So that's from the fact that they basically voted the king into power and his dynasty in the first place. And it was a democratic so- king? It was a hereditary line of kings, but Italy didn't exist as a kingdom until, like, in the late 1800s. And that was from a smaller kingdom who, when they took over, everyone else agreed, let's have that king be the king of Italy. Because the best uh, I mean, thing a democracy should have sure, is Sure, okay, so they voted the original <clears throat> guy in, but all, their, all that guy's children were not voted in and are probably different people. Well, that's true, yeah. Um, and also you got to keep in mind, this ain't exactly like an absolutist monarch. This is a guy who's like, uh, think like the, uh, the parliamentary monarchies of like Great Britain, that kind of jazz, you know, like there is a government with elected officials. Uh, there is democracy in that sense, but at the end of the day, the King is still like a big figurehead, especially when it comes to matters of foreign affairs and when it comes to the army, 
like the army swears their loyalty to the king. Uh, and so he's still kind of a big deal. He just doesn't have a lot of power. And in this case, he doesn't have a lot of know-how to rule either. So, in other words, Sounds kind like of an easy president. target. <laughs> yeah, except, uh, you know, the whole, like, swearing loyalty to the president, that's not exactly a thing here in the U.S. It's more, uh, you swear loyalty to the government, the Constitution, and all that stuff. So, slightly different. Although, in this case, it might have been good that that was the case. Uh, that they were loyal to the king, more so than to the government itself. Um, but yeah, so he starts poking at the king, and he's like, yeah, screw the king. He sucks. He doesn't know what he's doing. And then... Uh, poke, 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 poke. This, yeah, he started this, poking. This, 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 this sounds like, like the equivalent to back in the day when people would poke someone on Facebook. No, absolutely. I mean, like, you gotta keep in mind, this guy's just publishing a few newspapers here and there. He's like, the guy who, like, throws out a few insults in a private party, but then keeps his mouth shut when he's outside. You know, that kind mm -hmm. of deal. Because he's like, I mean, at the end of the day, they weren't exactly too friendly to socialists in Italy at that time. Um, but also, and this I think is a bit touchier, is uh, the fact that he was actually a very hardcore atheist to begin with. Because, mm. like, Not you know, the whole Marx... atheist? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, like, there's some people who are like, I don't believe in God, but that's just me, you know? Um, and then there's people like, Mussolini, who like takes the whole like religion is the opiate of the masses, you know, and that stuff. God isn't <laughs> real. They're just doing that to keep you oppressed. And uh religion is a Machiavellian construct. So you're saying yes. Tortel <laughs> yeah. So you're saying Tortellini is a high school edgy high school student. Honestly? <laughs> Woke science kid. Very much like that. Except he wasn't good at science either. Keep in mind, he was a Okay, was so just an edgy idiot. He he was just edgy. Yeah, pretty much. He's probably and, uh, one of those edgy druggies that sat in the back of the classroom and like tried to make everyone convert to atheism. Except he was the teacher. Oh Except god. He was the teacher. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> also, he's like the kind of guy who um uses like this kind of like, you know, like radical edginess to like try to pick up girls because he was a oh, huge dear. womanizer oh, too. Oh boy. So he's like every yeah. single TikToker. Every yeah. single male uh, TikToker. Mussolini was a TikToker in the early <laughs> 1900s. The most toxic of TikTokers. Man, really ahead of his time. I know, yeah. right? Who would have thought that this kind of stuff existed before the, uh, the advent of the internet? But no, yeah. apparently the newspaper was a significantly longer version of a TikTok video. And it could just be as stupid. So, um, <laughs> I mean, like, that's not to say that, like, the groups that he associated with weren't necessarily dedicated. But, like, the way that Mussolini was taking this whole socialist thing, it was very much just to be, like, against the mainstream, you know? It's just, like, there to be different, to stand out, because you don't want to work for the system, man. Maybe a hipster would be a better term. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, because, like, at this point, he's old enough to be a hipster. Um, oh, God. But, uh, socialist yeah. Make it any hipster. better. Yeah. So, a socialist hipster... Uh, who's just kind of like doing things to like go against the tide of things, and um, yeah, are, is is being an elementary school teacher a his a hipster job? Well, he wanted to Me. be a teacher so he could have more power and to be able to like talk oh, down. To okay, people. so he wanted to be a teacher, but he was okay. No, no, we're really locking in that whole hipster thing right now. Yeah, once again, he got an education. He never put that to use as he wanted it to be. He, oh. he never actually was a teacher. I mean, clearly, if he, he ended up being hanged by a wire, probably didn't no, get the job. I, I believe. I believe he like he got educated and then he realized, wait, I'm gonna have to be a functioning adult that needs to serve in the military if I want to be a teacher too in Italy. Wait, I so, can't beat up kids as the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> not without having getting beaten up first is like ah oh, damn i thought i already did my lumps on the streets beating up other people man so, i should have been a cop yeah he should <laughs> damn he would have been and i hear a siren in the cop. background too so it's like oops uh that's too so when he avoided the draft do you know if he had to suffer any consequences from that well he when he came back to italy they're like ha, we got you now and it's like all ah. right fine <laughs> so he had to do it but once again as i said before he didn't have to do any fighting this time uh, because by 1905, a lot of the conflicts with the Ottomans were kind of like played out. And uh, he basically just was on active duty for two years. And then he was discharged and he was able to go back to publishing his edgy newspapers. To be fair, that's a pretty good scenario to be in because you can still say you served in the military and that you, you know, you actually did everything that right. you were technically yeah. supposed Without to, but you didn't actually have to fight. Yeah. I got injured. 
No, oh, he yeah, didn't even get I, injured at I this went point. Through an it literally was course. just like I got I went through training. I waited in the barracks in case anything bad happened. Nothing bad happened. I got sent back. That's it. That's it. He just did his stint and he was done. So yeah, like Kevin, as you said, he could definitely like claim the street uh, the street cred of like I don't just beat up little kids anymore. I also served in the army. Uh, of so course, I beat up adults sent. too, and the occasional yeah. child soldier. So kids with he just got yelled at by his drill sergeants. I'm sure. <laughs> I don't think he ever got around to beating up anyone else. I'm just imagining him standing there as like four drill sergeants are screaming in his face, and he's like, "I can't punch these guys. Like, They're I'm not write kids." This in my newspaper. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I'm gonna regret this. <laughs> All my thousands of newspaper readers are going to hear You don't have any idea you. how many followers I have. Do you know who I am? I have the I'm biggest an TikTok influencer. in this little village. <laughs> I'm an influencer. Yeah, he is. I'm he an is upcoming YouTuber. Yeah. Oh, God. And uh, the thing is, like, he kept this up, too. Like, he, he got arrested. Because they're like, bruh, stop it. You're spreading a bunch of this ridiculous shit, trying to, like, take down the king of the church. And, uh... We're not going to stand for that. So he gets thrown in prison and he comes out and is like, you can't shut me down, man. I'm against that <laughs> side of shit. I'm going to speak against out the machine. More. Yeah, he is such a hipster. Your and then, and then, powers have no effect on me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and the best part is that then he got a chance to actually rage against the machine at a time when people actually were kind of on his side. Because like, keep in mind, like being a socialist in Italy wasn't the biggest kind of thing like i mean yeah there's a lot of middle class people in italy who are like fuck you shut up believe in capitalism so that wasn't really good but you know what's one thing that the socialists and the capitalists were able to unite on in world war one get rid of the fascists no there were no fascists at this point right. oh world war one uh, yeah uh dying a lot yeah dying a lot ain't good for the bottom line you know <laughs> Whether that be for like a revolutionary cause or for like trying to make money. I mean, yeah, there's war profiteers, but they're like, we could sell weapons to both sides. That's more money, you know? Mm -hmm. So the Italians, uh, quick context. In World War I, uh, Austria, Hungary, and Germany were united together. And Italy was supposed to be with them as well. Like they had a long standing alliance there. Especially because Germany was afraid Italy and Austria, Hungary were going to go to war first. So they're like, we're just going to make nice and make you guys fight for each other rather than against each other. Except mm -hmm. Italy, when they realized that this war was going to go down with the likes of Great Britain, Russia, and France, especially Great Britain, which has a huge-ass navy, and Italy, which has a huge-ass coastline that they can't really hold against <laughs> the British navy, they're like, you know, there was like a, I think there was a technicality in our agreement that I'm just going to invoke, and uh, we're going to be neutral. Bye. So... Italy just, uh, for the huge majority of the war, just stood outside of the fray. Probably they were kind the of smartest decision things. they could have made, honestly. I mean, like, yes, it's a rational decision, definitely. And there were, like, some pretty far-right people in Italy, too, who were like, what are you talking about? We gotta go and fight. Like, the Ottoman Empire are evil, and they're on the German side. But never mind that. <laughs> we shouldn't fight anyways. Because... Um, but then, but then someone was like, wait a second, hold on, you're right, we could fight the Ottoman Empire. And they're like, oh no. <laughs> wait, but that goes against, like, 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 going neutral is one thing. Fighting against the people that we signed the treaty with is like a whole nother shitstorm right there. But then Great Britain was like, I'm sorry, breaking treaties? I'm interested. Can I perchance entice you with some more land after the war? <laughs> a big Uno reverse card there. Exactly. And, uh, and at this point, too, Mussolini was like still very much on like the whole like socialist anti-war wave. It's like, we should not fight this war. Look at the Russians. They just had a whole revolution just so that they can overthrow the Tsar and not have to keep fighting in World War I. Why am I calling this World War I? I don't know. But I'm going to be edgy and I'm going to say there's going to be a second one. Whose fault is it? It's not my fault. But I think it's going to happen because y'all don't listen to me. Truly and, ahead uh, of his time. Oh, very advanced for his time. Yeah. But uh, so he's like looking at the Russians and how they pulled out and they had their own communist revolution. And he as a, a socialist in air quotes uh, was still like, we should not fight this war. 
But then all of a sudden, a few checks start coming his way. Um, and uh, after becoming filthy rich in the course of about a month or so, he, he changes his tune. Well. stock back then? <laughs> no, that would have been a true <laughs> hipster right there. No, I, I don't think it was that much of a visionary. He might have invested in Volkswagen. That was starting to rise. <laughs> so, was it? But um, basically, wait, I do. Wait, hold on. Was it? No, no, never mind. Volkswagen was after that's that World War Two, isn't it? Before World War Two, like Volkswagen. in the interwar. Okay, okay, it was developed. Yeah, no, it was. It was developed as part of the Nazi regime. The Beatles. We all know that Tong part. isn't a car person. Please. You, you got <laughs> the wrong <laughs> war there, he bud. Everything he says about cars is correct. Uh, yeah, yeah, you Kevin know. here is our local car head. No, no, he was he was probably investing in like the uh the small like those like fairly runnable station wagons. Which funny story in World War One, they have they, station wagons back. Huh. It was like a weird converted version of them. Um, it's like imagine a it's like a, a Model T Ford, but like with a weird elongated oh, trunk in the back. Oh, coach building. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I guess Classic that's a wagon right there. Yeah, it's not Except, really uh, what we consider a wagon nowadays, I guess, but it does work. Plus, it's yeah, a maybe like an SUV. Something well, like at least they're better than horse-drawn cars, right? Uh, actually, Truly the horse-drawn of cars time, were kind Mussolini of better. Was investing in crossovers. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing was that, like in World War One, those things actually were used on the trenches. Which, uh, you know, after it gets like the entire world around you is bombed up, churned into mud, those things don't really do much when it comes to trying to drive across those things. Like, if the road ain't flat, those things aren't going. So. Mm-hmm. Trying to drive yeah. one of those things probably wasn't the best. But, Unfortunately, uh, they had yet to invent Jeeps and Land Rovers. Or no, tanks. They, they also didn't have thick tires back in the day, too. It was still very much like thin tires and hard wheels. British like basically Land a wagon didn't wheel. come around until later in the war, too. No. In fact, at this point, they were barely starting to invest in gasoline engines for their ships. Uh, <laughs> it was still coal-powered. So like, imagine like this ah. was like steampunk at its finest. A lot of ships at this time. Uh, Great Britain was the first one to start switching over, which is why they're like looking at the Middle East, like, hmm, oil, interesting. Mm, cha-ching. Tell and me. And also, more. like the Ottoman Empire, they got a lot of land that we could carve up. So Italy, you want to join us? We can give you a nice sliver of land. And uh, also, all these donations, quote unquote, started coming in to uh, to Mussolini's newspaper, and all of a sudden oh. he's like, "We should fight on the side of the British." Against the evil Germans <laughs> oh and the evil Austro-Hungarians who we have a blood like uh, rivalry with. Which, to be fair, they did kind of have that. Um, and also, we should go ahead and invade the Ottoman Empire just because they're there and we should try to take some islands for us. It's and, crazy uh, how big of a presence the Ottoman Empire had considering it's completely non-existent now. Oh, yeah. And also, like, Austria-Hungary as an empire does not exist anymore. It's broken up into a bunch of small countries. Um, And, like, that's the thing. Like, back in the day, they used to call the Ottoman Empire the sick old man of Europe because it was seen as, like, weak and falling apart. But it still had a lot of control and influence. Uh, It was just an old guy that had a lot of power. But, like, constantly uh, old. What is the (laughs) modern equivalent of the Ottoman Empire, anyway? Like, what did that The boomers? (laughs) <laughs> no, I mean like no, it's Turkey. <laughs> what? It's Turkey. Turkey's is oh. uh, Turkey except like Turkey's big? actually kind of powerful. Oh, Turkey was huge. Like oh Turkey was like a slice, like a chunk of the Ottoman Empire. Like Egypt was part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, most of North Africa was part of the Ottoman Empire. Saudi Arabia was right. part of the Ottoman Empire. Israel is part of was part of the Ottoman Empire. Is In that, that why that the point, birds are so big? Yeah, yeah, and that's why they have so many feathers that you can pluck out. Because that's basically what they were doing with it. They were just one <laughs> after another, just carving it up. Right in time for Thanksgiving, too. So, but yeah. Oh, we so still got a few huge, months. <laughs> this huge amount of money comes in. And, um, like, in my class notes, uh, the, the professor kind of, like, insinuated that these donations were meant to sway him over to be pro-war. Yeah, but he didn't really say. Lot, like, from what you're saying, it's like the British uh, injecting some uh, ideas extra motivation. Into Mussolini. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the best yeah. way, <laughs> the best way to stop a socialist, give them money. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and 
It's to redistribute later along the way how he sees fit, which he did redistribute to all his mistresses. So, you know, very limited socialism. But <laughs> the thing is, we never really went over who gave that money. And um, so, like, when, when I was, like, writing uh, the notes for this bit here, I, I was, like, looking into this. And uh, it turns out in 2009... Uh, this British historian was diving into some archives and found records of how the British MI5, like their secret service, uh, like Ooh. their CIA, basically. Uh, I thought it was MI6. MI6 is like the whole like James Bond stuff. But like MI5 is like the more like... Uh, MI6 the, doesn't exist. MI6 doesn't exist. MI5 is like what you consider with like diplomacy, espionage, that kind of stuff. That's Wait, like are very there, much. Where, like, are there? Is there MI one through four? Uh, I'd imagine. I think you MI one. No, I think MI one is like the reception service for all these groups. MI two. Oh, that's kind of. That's kind of. I don't know. I, I really don't know. But like MI five, pretty renowned like intelligence agency, and they started pumping like a hundred euros or a hundred pounds rather a week to uh, to Mussolini. To like spread pro war propaganda, God because damn. their idea is that like Italy at this point, if we could start hitting the like right now, the Russians are faltering uh, because they're suffering their own revolutions back home. America's dragging their heels, so we need as many people teaming up as we can to put the pressure on Germany and Austria Hungary. So they're like, let's get Italy in the mix too, because they're like they're a wannabe superpower. So like we could use this boost their ego, boost their revenues, and then help us defeat the uh the central powers so he gets these checks and he starts spreading all this stuff about like trying to convince italy to fight against the uh their former allies if you will <laughs> as a quick aside there is an mi1 through 19 by the looks of it wow are you okay, serious that's a lot it's <laughs> military intelligence section one through two three four five nineteen Wait, but huh. there's no MI6? There is Wait, do you MI6. think they... Oh, okay. You just don't speak of MI6. <laughs> do you think they ever mix up, like, MI1 and MI11? Or, like, they, they say, like, M11 by accident? Because, like, <laughs> and I. <laughs> it, in paperwork, probably. Yeah. Oh, my God. Could you imagine I'm just that? imagining... I'm just imagining... <laughs> That's why you gotta use the sending the, the order to the wrong, wrong division. And they're like, yeah. what the fuck? We can't do any of this. <laughs> what do you mean you want us to do this? <laughs> Um, but like, basically, because all this money starts flowing in, and he starts switching his tune to be like very much anti, uh, anti peace at this point, and um, all the socialists who he was like hanging out with were like, "The fuck are you doing, bro?" <laughs> <laughs> and so they like, if there were any doubts that like he was a socialist back then, they were very well made clear at this point, and he just got kicked out of all the socialist circles, which like. You know, for a guy who was all about, like, you know, trying to put himself above the others, it was going to happen sooner or later, honestly. Yeah. But now he's like, damn, I have all this money. I have this influential newspaper, and I have no idea how to spend this. <laughs> so he starts paying street thugs, effectively, to, like, enforce his newspaper ideals. Like the way the way that I think about this is like imagine like newspaper boys like those newsies you know like the kids on the side screaming and like waving their newspapers around they right? get it they get their I'm own just posse or something no 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 but just, but like like they're not rolling quite, up their but like you take that like with like the little caps the and everything yeah they're just Sorry, rolling so that, up their newspapers and whacking people in the head with them and be like accept this yeah no 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 you gotta turn them bigger like turn them into like beefy oh my guys. God. Who are like on the streets who are like basically might have been like mafia rejects and they're like <laughs> hey you want to support the war effort it's like no thanks i'm like my brother's in germany i don't want this to go wrong it's like and then just like slap him on the side of the head it's like join the army you know support the war i'll come and burn your house down so uh effectively like yes at the beginning when like there was like talks about italy joining the war a lot of people were like protesting the war efforts but all of a sudden when Mussolini started publishing his newspapers for some reason no one really challenged his opinions where he was like pretty prominent and uh basically by using these armed thugs he was able to start intimidating people 
from uh, speaking out against the war effort. And wouldn't you know it, Italy near the end of World War I decides to join the war. And uh, to his credit, uh, Mussolini did put his money where his mouth is, and he actually signed up. He re-enlisted in the army. This guy who, as a kid, like as a young man, fled his own country just to stay away from joining the military. He signs up again so he could fight in World War I. Wow. I mean, What a nationalist dude. I know, right? And he never even made it to the front lines because he got hurt in a training mission. So, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so he's like over two at this Maybe? point. Yeah, it I might have been you. intentional. I he's bet like, oh, you no. Just... I twisted in my ankle. I can't find my foot. <laughs> I, bet wow. you, I bet you his injury was that his hairline was receding and he couldn't take it to the front line. <laughs> My bald head makes me a clear target. I cannot do this. I'm going to back <laughs> home to my newspaper. Ciao. And then he like heads out. And uh, sure enough, after World War I, he, uh, at this point, he's been in the army twice. He's never been actively involved in any sort of battles at all. He's never made it past like the borders of his own country. And after Italy finishes fighting his war, he's like, hey, look at that. I helped make our country win. You know, like, yes, I did get rich on the side, but I did it for Italy. I did it because I love my country and I wanted to expand its borders and become great. And uh, and uh, that, that was kind of the ambitions of a lot of Italians, like even those who like might have not been happy with the whole fighting a war thing, because the whole idea is that like we're here, we might as well take the fruits of victory. You know, we're on the winning side. We deserve something for coming in because like, yes, they didn't fight for that long. Yes, they didn't lose a lot of lives, but. They still did commit a lot of people to it. A lot of military lives and material were sacrificed in the process, too. And so Italy was like, time for us to be the new big power. You know, like Germany's gone. It's not going to be powerful again. Uh, Italy is going to be the new Germany. We're going to be that great, you know. Um, And uh, so the British were like, yeah, I mean, we did promise them some lands in North Africa, some lands in like the Ottoman Mediterranean area. So, like, let's go ahead and do that. And, uh, like, the Italian prime minister at, like, the peace conferences was, like, asking about, like, okay, so if you could slice up a bit of that land there, give that to us, we'd be happy. We'll change that to your side. We'll support your claims there. All this kind of, like, backroom wheeling dealing that was, like, the the pinnacle of old age imperialism, you know, in which, like, right. great powers just sent their leaders in to carve up the world into spheres of influence. And then a certain college professor came in by the name of Woodrow Wilson, who uh, happened to be the president of the United States at that time. And he's got this whole thing about like countries should have the ability and people should have the ability for determining their own freedoms and their own country borders and that we should get rid of old age imperialism and we should all come together and sing Kumbaya as a League of Nations except black people and Asians and, <laughs> you know, anyone that's not white. Because, I mean, yeah, he's a, he's a utopian, yes, but he's also a fucking racist. the whole wide world. <laughs> and except also women should shut the fuck up and get off his back. He gave him the right to vote, so that's, that should be good enough. You know, women are now equal. Feminist causes are no longer needed. So, yeah. But, like, our, uh, our, Hippocratic, uh, our, our hypocritical moralists here Woodrow Wilson, like, when he gets wind of this whole, like, you made what promises to Italy? You're just gonna carve up another empire without caring about what the people say? Shut up, African Americans. Um, <laughs> no, you can't do that. And uh, he basically, well, he says no to their faces at the conference. So, like, this is, like, between all the diplomats and stuff, locked away in, like, their big fancy hotels and all that. But then... Mm-hmm. Somehow, he gets onto, like, a radio broadcast that's sent to Italy, where he's like, hey, Italians, you don't deserve to get anything from this war. And let me break down why you don't deserve jack shit. You're like, this ain't gonna (laughs) go And so he's like, you came in late, this stinks of old age imperialism, which is evil, shut up African Americans, and also... It means that you guys are going to get way too much stuff and you can't control all your people. So there, you don't deserve it. You're not a superpower. Bye bye. And the prime minister finds out like the next day. He like wakes up and is like, you did what? What is the point of that? Like, 
he he wanted to explain his reasoning for why Italy doesn't deserve good things. All right. To the Italian people, because he's like, Wait, I'm just... a professor. I talk down to people as a like that. That's my job, you know. And now I'm a president, but I'm also a professor, so I can do both on a bigger level. You know so what? I did that to a whole different of... country. Oh I think he was a professor of history. He was a hist- uh, He was a history professor. All right. Yeah. So he's so, Utah. I'm not a professor of history. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm a history major. I suffer the whims of history professors, which thankfully <laughs> I haven't had any bad ones at Tufts. Um, but, like, he just goes on to radio, lectures Italy as to why they suck and they don't deserve any fr- from all their sacrifices, and then pieces out. To which that the, totally won't bite him in the ass later. Yeah. Because he was like, look, Prime Minister, I know you're feeling like you're going to have a lot of difficulties with trying to explain why you didn't get anything from the peace conference for your country. So I went ahead and did that job for you. Oh. <laughs> you should be thanking me. I'm like, you know, I, I am a visionary. I can think ahead. Like, this is the future of things where America to be fair, tells you what you should do. So, like, to I, be I fair, now everyone hates him, not the prime minister. Yeah. That's true. Uh, so the prime minister, like, to, like, scrape together whatever dignity he has left, he's like, fuck this shit. I'm just going to go home. So even before, like, the peace treaty is, like, concluded, Italy just, like, stomps out of the peace conference because they're like, we're not going to get anything from this anyways. Because at this point, Britain and France are too busy trying to, like, kiss up to Wilson, who came in and saved their butts, to, like, really, like, speak up on, like, little Italy's behalf over there. So, mm-hmm. so yeah. Italy comes back from the war and it's like it, it came into the war hoping to be able to get some easy pickings because they could see the writing on the wall and they were promised a lot of good stuff and they come out with very little gains on the on the grand level of things and the people aren't happy about that no sir like it got so bad to the point where uh, a poet by the name of D'Annunzio decides if they're not going to give us something why, why don't we just go and take it for ourselves. Oh. So, so they go into ah, this. Yes. Uh, I know, right? Like the whole good old fashioned idea of just go and take it. Was that the act, the verba- poem verbatim, or was it a little bit more elegant than that? I think it was something more like, uh, Mamma mia, if it is a red and it smells like a pasta sauce, it belongs to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it, <laughs> pretty much. So then they painted the streets red uh, of a city called, uh, well, in Italian called Fiume, uh, which is like right across, uh, like right near like where the Balkans are. So like north of Greece, kind of hugging uh, Austria. And uh, they went in, they captured the city with like a band of armed men. So like imagine like vet- re- like returned veterans who are like all like angry that they didn't really win anything. And also like a bunch of like antsy, like like edgy teens with guns who are like, yeah, we're going to make a name for ourselves. We have disgruntled army. Yeah, pretty much. So they come in, they go ahead, they capture the place, and then they run the town for a bit. And the Italian government, even though everyone's like, hold on a second, that's illegal. And the Italian government's <laughs> like, yeah, no, stop. What are you doing? No, no. And uh, they don't really do much against them in the grand scheme of things. Oh, no, Wait, you shouldn't illegal. have. No, you really shouldn't have. And As they nudge the army yeah. forward more. And meanwhile, D'Annunzio is over there. He's like, yeah, no, I did this for Italy. So, like, this is technically, like, I'm ruling on behalf of the Italian government here. And to his credit, Fiume did have, like, a large Italian population in it. It also had a large non-Italian population who was not very happy about this. But... Uh, as a result of this action, Italy finally like negotiates to like make Fiume kind of its own independent city state, uh, and part of that deal was to get D'Annunzio's crazy poetic ass out of there. To which D'Annunzio <laughs> is like, "Fuck you, kiss my ass. This is my city now. I'm gonna make this my place. So screw you, Italy." Uh, and he basically yeah. declares war on Italy as a result. Oh my god! All right, the it one does not person. go away from that. The one poet. person declared war. Yeah, and poets are a lot more. The poets were a lot more violent back then. Emo the army. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. Uh, it was definitely a more impressive action by a poet, but uh, it didn't really last that long. And he kind of got his butt stomped by the French and the Italians, who came in and made sure that he was no longer there. 
But the thing is, this whole attitude of like the government's not doing enough, so fuck it, we should just take everything into our own hands. That has started to become a a very popular sentiment. Like on a on a I guess a patriotic level, a lot of people felt like the Italian government failed them because it failed to give them new lands, it failed to give them any new power prestige on the international level. So when they heard about this crazy poet guy who just went across the Mediterranean Sea to go and take over the city for himself, they were like, you do you, dude. And everyone was like kind of encouraging this entire action. Wait, so, and did he have an army or did he literally just, like, how did he... He rounded he up to... like around 100 people or so, gave them weapons, and kicked out the local garrison. And just just like, like random civilians? It's, yeah. Honestly, like... So, Keep in mind, remember how everyone in Italy, if they're an adult male, had to, like, serve in the military for some period of time? Right. So, like, they had some military training, I guess, technically. But, like, at the end of the day, these are, like, shopkeepers or, like, pamphleteers and college students who joined with them on this kind of stuff. So, not exactly, like, you know, a mercenary band. Just a peasant militia more. Honestly, yeah, kind of like that. A, a militia force. But because of that, everyone was like, that is what a great man does. He goes across the seas, kicks out a legitimate government, and then later gets crushed by his own people. That is what heroism is. And we should try to emulate that. So Yay, violence! I know, right? So, um, as a result, this whole like patriotic fervor is like now turning against the government. Because the government is now seen as anti-patriotic. We're trying to curb that kind of activity, you know, trying to prevent people from breaking international laws is now considered a bad thing. Yeah. But did Mussolini get uh, involve himself in any way in this, or is he like talking about this on his little newspaper blog? I'm sure he was at this point. He's like changed newspapers because like the socialist one kicked him out. Um, oh, but yes. he's uh, he's been like he's been he's been pretty active on the whole publishing side of things and. Uh, I don't have any specifics about this, but he definitely channeled that zeitgeist of like, we got to be patriotic Italians, worthy of our forefathers of Rome, you know, that kind of idea. Make mm-hmm. Italy great again, you know? Oh None of this. Yeah, bring back, the, bring back the days of Rome, you know, yeah. the whole thing with slavery and using gay sex to assert dominance and all that That's Greece, stuff. not Rome. Oh. Yeah. Same thing. Ah. I think an Italian and a Grecian would disagree on that. But um, basically, he was more active on the whole patriotic front at home. Because in Italy, after the war, uh, the Italian economy was destroyed. It never had a big industry to begin with. So when they channeled everything to military efforts, that meant that the domestic economy suffered a lot. They also took out a lot of loans, hoping that they could cover by like getting new land and all that stuff after the war was over. But that didn't happen. So a lot of that stuff crashed too. And what's worse is that the Italian government, to keep things afloat, just starts printing money like nobody's business. And uh, when everything is just monopoly money in their hands, uh, oh, especially yes. if you're the wage workers who, on the one hand, you're getting paid in monopoly money. And on the other hand, you're getting paid the same wage that you used to have in monopoly money. So you don't even have higher monopoly money amounts to try to pay off your own bills. So people in the cities, especially, were not too happy about the situation. Um, yes, and, printing uh, money solves all problems. Yeah, yeah, it always, it solves everything, you know? And uh, especially if you uh, just make sure that no one has food to eat on the side, too. That really, you know, chef's kiss right there, chef's kiss. <laughs> and everything's going to be perfect. Um, but then... What happens is that because a bunch of these factory workers are like, hey, we aren't getting paid shit, despite the fact that like we're still working, maybe even more than before now at this point to try to help the economy recover. uh, I'm going to go and strike. I'm just going to I'm not going to do this shit anymore. And everyone immediately was like, people demanding living wages. That's communism. (laughs) They're communists. They're all communists. They're communists everywhere. And then meanwhile, like the tiny communist party, which like, imagine like four people in a dinky basement. They're like, I'm sorry, what's going on out there? Wait, there's four of us? Yeah. Like that's news to us. And we published the newspaper on this kind of shit. Come you what? So like, come you what? And meanwhile, the the workers are like, what's a communist? No, I just want to be paid actual money. 
that like you could work me to the bone you could keep the hours terrible i'm fine with that oppress me all you want big daddy but just give me money so like, <laughs> oh my <good>. god <laughs> so and like uh also like everyone's like oh my gosh look at what happened in russia they had a communist revolution too so like we could have one on our hands because the workers are refusing to go to work for scraps this is horrible. This is terrible. No, what is going to happen to the world? I oh. would argue not paying your workers actual money is far more communist. <laughs> That's kind of true, yeah. yeah. This is like, the first domino, and soon the next one shall fall. Yeah, and uh, as a result, there is a huge fear of communism out there. But like... You got to keep in mind that the workers, after a while, when they realize that the strikes and stuff aren't going to do things, they kind of like organize themselves into little groups too. Not not political parties, not any sort of like uh, militant revolutionaries. No, they're just organizing themselves into like roving gangs of people. Um, alongside with that are like all the veterans who came back. They're demobilized, so they don't have a job serving the army anymore. And because the economy is shit, they can't find a job. So a bunch of these unemployed vets are running around in gangs, just literally just beating people up, robbing people, and blowing up stuff. So in the cities of Italy at this time, it's literally just chaos in the streets. There's like rival gangs going around. All of them have like a different color shirt because they all went ahead and like organized like the right t-shirt buying and all that stuff. You know, you yeah. know how it is, right? Like you aren't a gang unless you have your gang colors. So you gotta have a team shirt. Exactly. With like the suitable emojis and like the suitable kind of like clip art put onto it. Because like at the end of the day, when you're a gang, you don't have the time to be hiring a graphic artist to like design all your stuff. You just got to slap it together on like, what do they call it? Like etchy or like uh, MS Paint? Custom Ink or something like that. You know, custom like those like t shirts. Yeah, like those, it's like those like t shirts. Yeah, pretty much. You just slap them on and hope for the best. Because like at the end of the day, you think, it's about You think as a graphic thing. designer would know this? but I only use actual tools. Well, that's the whole point. They didn't have this kind of stuff, you know? You think they have... And that's like, why you call me in. <laughs> They're just like, ah, oh, Benito, would you mind if you go ahead and, like, slap together a few stick figures with, like, big dicks and we'll call it a day. <laughs> it, it's, it's supposed to represent who we are as people. What, we're dicks? Exactly! Wait, no, <laughs> not like that. <laughs> wait, 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 no, wait. <laughs> But, like, um, as a result, there's, like, a bunch of different gangs going about. And uh, Benito Mussolini, remember the whole shtick about him, like, paying hired thugs to go around and spread his message in his newspaper? Mm hmm So he's kind of already got, like, some inroads with folks like that. And after he's able to flex his military cred of getting injured on the training fields, he's uh, able to rally <laughs> together a bunch of, like, veterans and, like, angsty, like, uh, college students and unemployed people. And uh, they call themselves the black shirts because they the wear black shirts. shirts. Yeah, because they, they wear, wear shirts, shirts that are black. Um, so they gave up on their graphic design and just wore black shirts. This is they're just like, hey, look, I I know I know you said that we have to pay like our 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 gang dues to like buy t shirts, but like I don't have a job. And then everyone else is like, me neither. No, I don't. I mean, like, I had a job, like, two years ago, but after I finished beating up innocent people, I realized they weren't going to pay me anymore. So, <laughs> yeah. we How are we going to buy these stuff? And they're like, well, surely you must have something that's black that you can wear on your body. They're like, Let's just go with it. Yeah, but so, you does, know what? so does everyone else, though. Like, that's that doesn't... How do you... You that's don't stand out because you're wearing a black shirt. That's just that's You're just point. wearing it a black shirt. It makes it look like everyone is supporting them. Boom. Yeah, this makes their <laughs> movement seem a lot bigger than it actually is. It's like yeah. the communist party that they had. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, like, if, if everyone's wearing black shirts anyways, it's like, let's do it, you know? It looks like we have a large army when, in fact, it's just people who came out to see what the fuss was about. But yeah, no, a bunch of these guys came out, they like started wearing all these black shirts and they started just like beating up, especially the communists and suspected communists. Um, so the four which, communists again, that were just sitting in their corner. Yeah, it's like the four communists in their mother's basement who's like playing cards and like trying to publish a newspaper together. All of a sudden like these guys wearing black shirts kicks down their door and is like just beating them up. And they're like, 
wait, what's this for? We didn't even do anything. We aren't <laughs> doing anything in Italy. Like, literally, the <laughs> most we're doing is publishing a newspaper and talking to some angry workers every once in a while. And Benito Mussolini is like, yeah, but that's not how you do it. Look, if you want to be good at the newspaper biz, and trust me, I've been good at the newspaper biz. You gotta pay hired thugs to go and beat up people to buy your newspapers. No one's gonna buy them otherwise. Who reads print media nowadays, you know? <laughs> he was a, he as, was a man wait, ahead as opposed of his time. to what else? Well, TikTok, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess we've established that. <laughs> yeah. Ye olde Italian TikTok. But yeah, so we see like these roving gangs of black shirts running about. And meanwhile, Mussolini is like, this 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 black shirt thing. Like, I mean, it, it's like decent branding, but like we gotta be something better. You know, we we gotta be able to attract a following that knows it has a purpose, aside from beating up random people that we call communists on the streets. We gotta we gotta seem like we are a disciplined group of people that are out there to change the world. But also beat people up on the street. But also beat people up. So like like who was the best at changing the world and beating people up? Ah, yes, I got it. The Romans. We should emulate the Roman Empire. <laughs> the Romans. The Romans. This, Indeed. How long have yeah. they been... Uh, has the Roman Empire been dead at this point? A while. Over a thousand years at this point. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, but basically, they were like, hey, uh, we should go ahead and try to find some sort of like symbolism that's going to like represent us as Romans. Like, what are the Romans known for? Come on. What, what are the Romans known for? Walls? Empire? Walls, empire. empire. No, no, no. It's got to be something tangible. It's got to be something simple. Something that when people look at, they'll know. Like, like... Like, hey, An you're a history movie? major, right? Uh, yes, <laughs> that's why you're unemployed, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, okay. So what were the Romans known for? Uh, uh, slavery? Uh, uh, slavery? No, no, not good enough. It's got to be something powerful, something potent to show that we mean business. And that the we don't... Roman Roman. Like, like, I feel like, like slavery would be pretty potent. Yeah, but Wait. it's got to show that we, we don't... Like, we, we, we don't... Like, uh, like, like, we mean business. We are... The number twos to nobody. Like, we handle shit. Uh, uh, the Romans, uh, they had a great sewage system. What? Sewers. Oh my god, what? Yeah, uh, great plumbing. They, they were great. They had public bathrooms and everything. <laughs> For uh, the time. We could... So what, they have Mario as their mascot? I mean... <laughs> Wahoo! <laughs> <laughs> so we could, we could uh, try... It, uh... it just sounds like Toad when you do it. <laughs> it does. It really does. So we could try using a, a, a sponge and a stick. That's the thing that they use to like wipe their bums. That would be a potent symbol to show we deal with shit. And they're a mop. And Russell, uh, yes. No, no, no. You, you gotta think. It's a sponge, right? Like imagine like a so like so like, like a squeegee. Cleaners. It's kind of like yeah. that, basically. Except you use that to wipe your ass, and then you plunge that into a bowl of water, and then someone else uses it after you're done to wipe their ass. Oh, oh that's fucking disgusting. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, the, the Romans had an interesting way of cleaning their asses. But it's a potent symbol of Roman power, right? You know? <laughs> and apparently, apparently so. someone... Uh... It does. It is quite <laughs> potent if you smell it. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, yeah. But, uh, you know, after uh, knocking that guy's head and saying that that wasn't the best suggestion for his symbol, um, they went ahead and took on this thing called the Fascus. Um which is basically a bundle of sticks with an axe in the middle of it. It's this whole idea about like, you know, the whole saying, like, you know, it's easy to snap one twig, but a bundle of twigs together, it's hard to break, you know, that whole idea. Uh, mm. yes, so there's yes. like that sense of unity. And also the axe was like a symbol of like the ability to like punish people. So back in ancient Rome, they used that for like, their like uh, various like, uh, head political figures they'd use that as a symbol of their power they'd have followers carrying that stuff next to them as bodyguards so Mussolini's like yes let's take that the fascus we should use that to be our symbol of roman power law and order that's what it's going to symbolize you know because we are all together it's organized and i am the law i'm the axe head you know so i could fuck your shit up and someone is like so what we're just going to be called the fascists it's like 
It's not bad, actually. You know, let's go with that. Why not? It works. Yeah, and uh, it's stuck ever so since. They're... So fascists are just a bundle of sticks. With an axe. With an axe. Without the axe, they'd be something completely different. But the axe is what uh, makes yeah, it yeah. so big. <laughs> yeah. But the whole idea is that they're trying to emulate all this Roman greatness. And they create this organization that they term as the fascists. And, uh, like, Mussolini would be the first person, like, when asked, like, so what exactly does a fascist believe in? Would be the first one to say that, like, we don't have time for an organized doctrine. Bruh, the streets are erupting in chaos. I have my people busy beating up people for not buying my newspapers. <laughs> I don't have time to write out a coherent ideology. But Man, the it, start of fascism was a lot more jank than I expected. No, it was super jank. He like explicitly is like, fascism is not a doctrine of philosophers and stuff like that. It's basically something that we created to deal with the crisis of what's going on in society nowadays. So he was honest about that, I guess. But like... It's, it's a band-aid. Yeah, very much. <laughs> it's a band-aid that beats you up and makes you bleed. Yeah. So... Not the best band aid, but a band aid by name, maybe. Sorry, what was that? It was a very interesting band aid, indeed. It was, yeah. But um, as a result, he he like he never really had a, a full spelled out doctrine until much later on, and uh, the idea that he was espousing as the Italian fascists, which at this point was the only fascists, mind you, uh, was that number one. We care about making Italy great. And in order to do that, we need our government to be great. Like, the government is all that matters, you know? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Right. As opposed to everything else that makes up a country. Because he's like, what are the other alternatives for a power structure? Are we going to trust individuals to speak for us? No. That's how you lose your freedom. But are wasn't the whole thing with the whole bundle of sticks together the point that individuals come together and stuff? Yeah, but the individuals come together to be something different. The idea is that so the individuals lose... come together, but not you. No, no, no. That... The individuals come together to lose. It's like the Power Rangers, you know, like when the Power Rangers join together. They combine into that giant Tyrannosaurus Rex-looking thing. The Megazord. Yeah, and that's Megazord. the fascist government. Yeah, they, they become the fascist Megazord. government of, uh, of Power so Rangers. So you're telling me, so you're telling me that Benito Linguini also made Power Rangers? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm yes. not saying he didn't, am I? But Man, we need a list of this stuff. He was, say what you will, this guy was pretty innovative for his time. But his whole idea is like, so this is where like the socialist stuff comes in. And he's like, you know, everyone's like, we got to worship like the economy and we got to like trust capitalists to do everything for us. But the capitalists were the reason why we were screwed in World War I. We should never have joined that war because it was only meant for the capitalists to make money off of it. And someone in the background is like, weren't you paid to publish articles to support the war effort? Shut up. <laughs> Shut but up. <laughs> the whole idea is that if we trust letting a capitalist system run rampant, we're going to turn out like the Americans and decadent and we're not going to expand anymore because everyone's too busy focusing on their individual efforts to really unify together. So capitalism... I mean, back. to be fair... Look at America. I think we have plenty of land. <laughs> yeah, th there is something to be said about that. Which is why, at the end of the day, he was like, we can allow capitalism to exist so long as all the capitalists agree to obey what the government tells them to do. So it's like, you could own your own factory, you could produce your own stuff, but if the government's like, hey, you're going to be creating pots for the army, you got to start producing pots for the army according to our specifications. So you still own it, you still run how everything works underneath it, but above, the government's telling you what you're doing this for. The government tells you what the role of your existence is, pretty much. And he's like, on the flip hand, if we talk about economies and all that stuff, we aren't dictated by money. We aren't dictated by the desire for wealth. Weren't you paid off to you know, switch <laughs> over from socialist causes to supporting a war? Shut up, Luigi. Shut up. But... <laughs> The idea here is that we are Scatty. people. We are people with a noble spirit. We are people with an individual sense of greatness and heroism, which spans beyond the pursuit of money, which is why trying to break us down by economic and social classes is going to be the ultimate downfall of a great country. 
So communism is stupid. Shut up. Don't listen to them because that means that they care about money and that's all they care about. And all his like socialist friends are just rolling in their graves at this point because they're like, what the fuck are you trying to talk about, bro? But he's like, we don't want to talk about things at a money level. We're talking about things on a spiritual level, man. A spiritual level. And you know what's man, more spiritual? Man, he was a hipster. I know. He is a hipster. It, it, and the best part is that he's like, you know what's the most spiritual people to hang out with, bruh? The, the government. Oh, dear. Yeah. The government. You feel me? What? The government is spiritual. Because they got a sense of greatness that goes beyond just one person, man. It's all about the entire entity working together as a power range of complex, of, you know, social, economic, political, and military forces to stomp out other people's existences, bruh. That's right, because the government's about. never, never done things to look out for their own self-interest before. Totally not a thing. No, 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 no. Because like you have right. a bunch of people in the government. Clearly, they won't be selfish if they're all working to the same goals, right? That means that must mean that the goal is good. And also, what goals should we be moving for? By the way, what goals are we looking at? Well, according to Mussolini, two things: expansionism, because an expanding country is a country that's alive and vigorous. Whereas any Wasn't country anti-imperialist at some point. Uh, that was before he got paid off by the British to say otherwise. But yes, I mean that was a long time ago. Like he, I think the deal's out now. He can stop. I mean, I think he, I think he's like, like you know the whole thing about like drug dealers. It's like you know, like you don't take your own supply. You know, don't get high off your own supply. I, I think he kind of like got high off of his own shit. So like <laughs> he really started buying he into got it, and high he didn't off fascism. Yeah, he pretty much got high off of fascism. He just kind of like caught him up, you know? So he's like... Man, money is a gateway drug to fascism. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> but also, he's like, you know, like having this government, we need to make sure that this we, we can organize people to be alive. And we could do that by making us expand. Because to not expand means we are now decadent, means that we are now too satisfied, which means we lose purpose in our lives, which means we're going to yeah. turn into America. And meanwhile, America's like, God oh, forbid you have a happy Ottoman. life. <laughs> or, or you become the Ottomans. Yeah, that's, that's a, I guess that's another way to like look at it from their perspective. And he's also you know, like, having, having a happy life is totally overrated. No, you happiness know? in life is not the way to go. Because, and, and this is like a second little bit here. You know when you feel the most alive? It's when you're on the borderline between life and death. And you feel the beating most alive. Beating up children. And beating up children. But if you want to try things on a bigger level, because as a country, beating up children is easy. You know, what you want to do is the next big thing, which is war. And war is wait, what wait, gives wait. purpose so he, to people. No, no, no. He, so you're, he's saying that you feel alive when you're between life and death. Is that why he was beating up children? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that... And I guess that maybe whole... that's why he graduated from that to like fighting other so people. So he was teaching the children. <laughs> he, oh, my God. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> he's raising them right you know yeah. oh damn but like he uh he basically is like going on this whole espousal of like warfare is what makes us great expansionism is what makes us great we got to emulate the old roman empire of the past italy is going to be great again and we're going to be a superpower that's not going to be pushed down by anyone and uh we're going to be a country of law and order to give everyone purpose and in order to do that I'm going to go ahead and tell my fellow black shirts to go out and beat up anyone that looks like a communist without any trial or reason. Naturally. Yeah. Because law and order, you Make know? Make Italy great again, mega. Yeah. Oh, God. But, like, law and order, and yet he goes around basically just killing people on the streets uh, because they're communists. Or they're just, like, pointing out the fact that he's, like, not being reasonable with the whole fact that, you know, He's War unreasonable. I couldn't great. tell. You're kidding me. The funny thing is, like, a lot of people at this point, uh, this is like known as like the the lost generation for a lot of people. This is like when you have like Hemingway and other like poets and writers who are like, war and existence is all pointless. War and the old imperialist dreams are just a fiction woven by the past powers to make us young men sacrifice our lives for a pointless cause. And meanwhile. And, like, those are usually people that had, like, fought in the war or, like, in the battlefields. Like, Hemingway, who, like, I think drove an ambulance in battle or something like that. Maybe that was, like, later on in Spain. But, like, a lot of people, especially, like, even, like, a slightly bit before them, too, 
uh, people who were in the Great War in World War One saw just like how destructive and pointless it was, and a lot of them were like disillusioned by the war itself and fighting and what it's all for, you know. But meanwhile, Mussolini, the guy who served in the army twice and never actually went onto a battlefield in his entire young life, he's like, "War is what makes it great, man." I mean, I wouldn't know. I've never fought in a war before, but like, yeah, that is what it's all about, <laughs> you know, that life or death thing of getting hurt on the training field. Oh, I revel in that. I revel in the smell of pulled muscles in the morning. <laughs> the sound of my sergeant shouting at me to get my ass out of bed. Yeah, that is what living is like. But uh, say what you will, even though he had like this whole convoluted like idea of what it means to be great and all that, y- you hit enough of those keys and people who are like, you know, disgruntled with the government, unemployed, and feeling like Italy and themselves could be a lot better than what they are, and they have, like, no real purpose for themselves at this point, they, they kind of start latching on to his, like, preaching, if you will. So, the, <laughs> the black shirts, they're never a big, like, they're not a political party. They're literally, once again, just, like, very much a street gang out there espousing their ideas. But they start getting a large following. Sounds what- like a really political motorcycle gang. It, yeah, it kind of. Except once again, they're not. They're above politics, man. They don't do politics, but they like. No, the they just money. beat up people in the street instead. Yeah, and then publish a newspaper that espouses <laughs> political views. Um, but on they're top all about of that, spiritual enlightenment. Of they're all about the spiritual zenness of violence. You know. Um, <laughs> Did they have motorcycles? They had motorcycles back. They had then, motorcycles, right? but I don't think they could afford them really. So they like, okay. Had, like, so so they were just riding around in bicycles instead. Yeah, I don't think they could afford bicycles either. Unicycles, maybe. It's riding around on unicycles. Are unicycles actually cheaper? Hey, you're saving on a wheel, aren't you? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> no wheel, no brakes, no gears. Yeah. So yeah. Just go around. They think you're an Italian clown, and then it's say you whip out a baseball bat, and it's like I'm a oh black shirt. <laughs> it's like everyone's wearing a black shirt today. What's your point? It's like no, you don't understand. I'm a black shirt. I work for uh uh the fascists. You know the fishies? No, 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 no. The the fascists. The f- no the fascist <laughs> and then it's like no, what are it. you trying to, what do you do what do you do I, I, it's too much to explain let me just hit you and get it over with this is hurting my head too much and then it's just <laughs> ah i'm gonna fall over <laughs> and then he pulls over <laughs> I, i'm like, not used to this thing yet balancing's really hard <laughs> yeah they, black shirts they really weren't about balance if you will in many respects um but Even though they were, like, if you really look at them, they were like a clownishly violent group of people running around trying to find purpose in their lives. They're like literally fight club. Uh, But like on a bigger level, the the government and like a lot of like the middle class and upper middle class, like the factory owners, for example, started taking notice because they're like, you know what I haven't noticed a lot recently? I haven't noticed a lot of strikes happening. Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh. What's going on here? And it, like, it's like, I mean, yes, all our workers are coming in with bruises and black eyes, but like, at least they're still on the assembly line, you know? And how is this happening? It's like, I, I believe there's a group called the feces running around outside. The, the what now? The, the feces. They're, they're, they're run by this guy by Benito Muscle Man or something. Huh. <laughs> I like this Benito guy's Muscle Man? I, I like his Benito style. Benito Fettuccini? Yeah. So he's winning over the old capitalists. Pretty much, yeah, because they're, like, whipping the workers into shape. And next thing you know, he starts getting checks from these guys, being like, I like what you do. Keep it up, you know? You got some <laughs> real, you got some, like, uh, you got some real good ideas. And I, I like your newspaper, too, even though it's, That's like, written in Comic function. Sans. Yeah, so as a result, heading into, like, the late 1920s, Mussolini, even though he's, like, not a politician, he's never been actively involved in organized politics in his entire life starts getting donations from the wealthy, starts building up a mass popular base, which at the same time, you got to keep in mind, there's a lot of different gangs running loose around Italy at this point. He's just happening to be one of the most prominent ones. Uh, But because he's anti-communist, which remember, once again, the communist threat in Italy, very low. It's just people who are not happy with the way that their wages are right now and they're going on strike and everyone's like flipping up and calling them communists. But because he's like, beating up innocent workers like that, he's able to start winning over some of the old blood too. 
So like all the landowning aristocracy, all the bigwig capitalists, they start sending some money his way as well. And it's around this time that our good friend Benito Mussolini starts thinking, you know, maybe I should consider politics as well. And he starts Man, organizing. this guy just really dumb fucked his way to the top. He really did, yeah. But at this point, he starts organizing something called the March on Rome, which I guess seeing how things are running a bit long, we should probably just call this the end of this episode. We'll hop in, start on the second one to show how this one guy who organized a violent street gang is somehow able to become the duce or the leader of Italy in a few quick years. Truly an idiot savant. The ultimate started <laughs> from the bottom, now we hear. Oh, indeed. Yeah. But yeah. Not until sure I got here, but now we hear. Now we hear, you know, and we got all the pasta we want. So, <laughs> tune in next time. You just and, uh, literally just popped out of a hole and said, It's a me! <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You just popped it's out a of me. my pipe. Mario! Yeah. Wahoo! <laughs> but yeah. So thanks again for joining us for this, um, and uh, we'll be back with the next episode on this Fascist Italy uh, series, and we'll be talking about his rise to the top of the entire Italian political system. But yeah, thank you for joining me, and be sure to tune in next time. Remember, don't be Benito Bucatini.